Okay, Congressman, we're live. This meeting is being recorded. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is former Congressman Steve Israel, now the director of the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs at the Jeb E. Brooks School of Public Policy at Cornell University. Uh, I'm delighted that uh, you can join us. Uh, we're joined by Aaron King Sweeney, who is the Associate Director uh, of the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs, uh, also uh, the Consul General uh, of uh, the Government of Poland, based in New York City, Consul General Adrian Kubitsky. And we are waiting at any moment now uh, for the arrival of Congressman Tom Malinowski. I will properly introduce both of our guests uh, in a moment. The purpose of the Institute of Politics and Global Affairs it's very simple. We want to deepen discourse and raise understanding of the most complex and complicated issues. We have featured President Clinton, uh, Reince Priebus, former ch chief of staff to Donald Trump, uh, General H.R. McMaster. Uh, we have featured a variety of uh, the most prominent members of the House and Senate and ambassadors and journalists and authors. Our rule is no sound bites. We exist to really understand the complexities and the challenges uh, of both domestic and foreign policy, and that's what we hope to do today. Uh, before we begin, just a little bit of housekeeping. On Tuesday, May 17th, uh, at 7 p.m., we'll be discussing the development of the U.S.-China relationship with Congressman Ami Berra uh, from California. Uh, he has really specialized uh, on this issue. He will uh, have a lot to say about the nature of, uh, of, of the evolving relationship uh, and bilateral relations between the United States and China. And then on Tuesday, May 24th, something very special from 8.30 in the morning until 2, uh, we'll be convening our first State of Democracy Summit at the Cornell Club uh, in New York City. This is a live event, but there will be a virtual option. In this day, uh, we will be uh, making an assessment of uh, the state of democracy uh, in the United States. We'll be looking at misinformation, disinformation, media manipulation with the foremost experts in the topic of special uh, three very special components to this program. One will be Congressman Adam Schiff will be with us in person, providing uh, his perspectives on the state of democracy on Capitol Hill. Republican Congressman John Katko from Syracuse, New York will also be with us live uh, discussing his perspectives. And then we're going to release the results of a fascinating poll that we commissioned on American electoral attitudes towards democracy. The results of this poll were completely unexpected uh, and we'll be sharing that. You can join us in person or you can join us virtually. As always, to register, go to our website. Best way of finding us is to Google us, just Cornell Institute of Politics. It'll bring you right to our site uh, and you can uh, register. Today, uh, a conversation about the Ukrainian refugee crisis. Uh, as you all know, Ukraine has become the epicenter of, the, of one of the largest human displacements in the world. Uh, as of late April, an estimated 7.7 .7 million residents have either reloc have relocated within the country and an additional 5.6 million Ukrainians have crossed the border. Poland has taken in 3 million of that migration. Uh, we are again waiting for Congressman Tom Malinowski. In the interest of time, I'm going to uh, provide some background information about Congressman Malinowski. Then Aaron is going to, then I will introduce the Consul General, and then we'll have the Consul General lead us off in conversation. Congressman Malinowski, who will be joining us uh, as soon as possible, he was actually born in Poland during the height of the Cold War. When he was six, he and his mother fled to the United States and settled in New Jersey. Who could have imagined when he and his mom settled in New Jersey that one day he would be a member of the United States Congress representing uh, New Jersey? He served as senior director on President Clinton's National Security Council, where he worked to end conflicts around the globe. He then served as the chief advocate for Human Rights Watch, where he led the bipartisan campaign to end the use of torture by the Bush administration. In the Obama administration, he served as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, uh, where he helped lead America's fight for human rights around the world. He was elected to Congress in 2018. He serves on the House Foreign Affairs Committee, the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and the Homeland Security Committee. Consul General Adrian Kubutsky assumed the post of Consul General of Poland in New York in March 2020. He joined the Polish Foreign Service and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in August of 2019, where he received the consular title and was appointed as, uh, to a four-year term as director of the Polish Cultural Institute in New York, part of Poland's diplomatic mission to the U.S. specializing in the field of public diplomacy. 
Previously, he served in the communications team at Lot Polish Airlines, where he initiated and ran a successful public campaign uh, educating Polish passport holders about the U.S. visa application process. That campaign guided Poland to be uh, being included in the visa waiver program in 2019. Before his tenure at Lot, he worked for seven years as a journalist at one of the largest radio stations in Poland, reporting on major news stories from Poland and many other countries across the globe. Consul General, we're honored by your attendance. We know that this is a particularly busy time uh, in your career. Let me, if I may, let me just lead it off with a question. Ask you to, to open it up uh, and give a, share with us, if you would, uh, a picture from the ground, a view from the ground uh, on uh, what the status is of refugees, Ukrainian refugees uh, in Poland and uh, other thoughts that you may have as we await Congressman Malinowski. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, thank you uh, for having me for this conversation. I think it's uh, at most important uh, to uh, look a little bit deeper into the problem that seems to be the problem of our century, actually, uh, also by numbers in terms of how many people are fleeing the war in Ukraine right now. Uh, but also um, as the exercising uh, kind of a new approach to the refugee crisis um, as we speak. Interestingly enough, uh, we don't even use the term refugees. Obviously, this is something that is understood by most of the people. Uh, we call them guests. And this is the, this, this major distinction between the approach of many other approaches in the past and this that is right now uh, happening in Poland. Um, from the very beginning, um, the numbers are pretty high. Um, it was even up to 100,000 people a day crossing the Polish border. And, and with that, Poland uh, was accepting the Ukrainian refugees to the households, to, to the homes of the ordinary uh, Polish people who um, stood up very quickly after the war started, um, went to the border, uh, they offered all kinds of support to, to Ukrainians. And we are here somewhat three months after um, this, this tragic event started, uh, we still proceed with the same approach. Um, however, with a little bit of the structure involved, uh, Poland, as a state of Poland, is offering the Ukrainian refugees a uh, form of uh, being accommodated into Polish society by granting them something that is equivalent of social security number. Uh, Ukrainian children are accepted to Polish uh, school system. Already over 300,000 of, of them uh, have, been, have been accepted to, to Polish schools. Um, uh, Ukrainians are, are offered with jobs. Uh, that will help them to sustain uh, their lives in Poland, as we expect, not, not only for another weeks, but perhaps even for another month or, or years. Uh, some of them decide to go back to, to Ukraine. Um, some of them decide to stay. Some of them decide to go somewhere else. Um, uh, whatever they decide to do, we know that there is a need of um, strong international collaboration to address their needs and to make sure that something that was initially very organic response by Polish people towards those people converts into a certain system of, of helping those people so uh, they can live their lives um, uh, until it's safe for them to, to go back to their home country. Um, and we advocate for this collaboration very strongly. Uh, we actually, uh, all of us at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but also all other parties involved are, are traveling uh, across Europe and, and to many other places um, to seek for that collaboration. Uh, it's been quite successful so far, but obviously we need more. Um, I think in order to achieve that, it is important to have conversations like this one which gives a little bit insight into the problem, which is more complex uh, than meets the eye. Uh, so I'm very glad that we are having this conversation. Um, uh, Representative Malinowski, who is a Polish born, uh, it's a great pleasure to have this discussion with you. Uh, and with you, Representative Israel, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor. And 
please feel free to ask any questions you have. Thank you so much. Before uh, I go to Aaron King Sweeney, I do want to welcome Congressman Molinowski. Uh, Congressman, I've uh, already shared uh, your amazing biography, the fact that you were born in Poland, settled in New Jersey, and, and all you did with that is grew up to represent New Jersey in the United States Congress. If ever there was an example of the American dream, you are it. I'm wondering if you can uh, open us up with your own perspectives and, and perhaps share uh, the breaking news uh, from last night that uh, the House has passed a $39 million supplemental appropriations bill uh, for Ukraine, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Great to see you, Consul General. Um, and, um, you know, I would say, uh, you know, a lot has changed, uh, Steve, since you left the House. Um, so it's actually a $39 billion, not million dollar. Oh, I, I thought I said billion. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> These days, you know, millions. <laughs> uh, so yes, indeed, we did. Uh, we did pass that legislation. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to say that we're still mostly bipartisan, mostly united in support of Ukraine uh, in recognition of the fact that the people of Ukraine are not just fighting to defend their country, they're fighting to defend all of us. They're fighting for a set of rules and norms and ideals that protects every country in the world against this kind of evil, this kind of aggression. And um, I'm happy that the main thrust of our policy right now uh, is not um, uh, is helping them win. Um, in the meantime, we have to care for people and help uh, our allies, including Poland, care for people who are taking temporary refuge from the storm. But the main thrust, again, is, is to ensure that um, Ukraine wins, that Ukrainian democracy survives, and that people can uh, go back and rebuild their their country. Uh, I'm incredibly moved, of course, as you can imagine, by what Poland is doing as the frontline state in in all of this. The the, the scale of what uh, the Polish people and the Polish government are attempting is is unprecedented. Um, the the generosity that they have shown, uh, the courage that they have shown in taking on this responsibility, is something that will be remembered for a very, very long time. Um, we, we all need to help. Um, and, and I'm glad that President Biden has, uh, in addition to humanitarian assistance, of course, that, that assists organizations caring for these refugees, that, that we as a country under President Biden have agreed to take um, at least some of the Ukrainians who are coming out who have close ties uh, to the United States and have a sponsor in, in the United States. Um, but I would, I would say finally that this is, this is not a um, traditional refugee uh, crisis in, in the sense that the overwhelming majority of, of the people who are leaving Ukraine right now very much want to go back um, relatively soon. Uh, as we all know, they are mostly not complete families. They are women and children whose male relatives are still back home in Ukraine fighting. Um, unlike most of the world's refugees, these folks mostly are not seeking permanent resettlement. Um, formal refugee status leading to permanent resettlement in the United States or Western Europe. Uh, they, they want a place to shelter and be safe for a while um, until it's safe to go back. Um, so again, our main emphasis right now has got to be on accelerating that day when it is safe for them to go back and, and to help them rebuild their country. One of the things that I've been working on that we passed in the House a couple of weeks ago um, is, uh, uh, is legislation that would enable um, the US government uh, and hopefully encourage other governments to um, actually seize uh, some of the Russian, the sanctioned Russian assets uh, that have been blocked and frozen around the world. Um, and then to use those assets um, to help the Ukrainian people rebuild their country. It's going to cost tens of billions of dollars, as we all know. We all know. I don't want to let a single $600 million yacht go to waste. Um, I don't want a single oligarch's private plane go to waste or villa. And I want us to be looking very carefully at the 
up to $300 billion in frozen Russian central bank assets uh, that uh, we believe uh, are um, held in Western Europe and the United States for, for the most part. Uh, so when these people do go home, there will actually be uh, support for their efforts to rebuild their, their country. Um, so that's something we're working on. Biden administration has embraced the idea. They've proposed additional legislative language for us that, um, that we are going to try to move, uh, hopefully, sooner rather than later. So anyway, with all that, thank you guys. Great to see you. Happy to uh, hear thoughts or questions. Thank you, Congressman. I'm going to turn it over to Aaron. Before that, let me encourage uh, our audience. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat room. Uh, and uh, we will endeavor to uh, respond to them. Uh, we have a hard stop of uh, just before noon. Uh, so we'll have another 15 minutes of, of our own questions and then turn it over to our audience. Erin King-Sweeney. Sure, thank you, Steve. And Congressman Malinowski, good morning and thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate your leadership on this issue. As a Polish born US member of Congress, can you please talk to us about the personal side of the Ukrainian refugee crisis in Poland? What does it mean to you based on your experience? My, my experience leaving Poland was, uh, was very nice. I, uh, we were not running away from bullets and, and bombs. Um, it was, uh, uh, my, my mother's intention in bringing me to the United States was very much in part to, to take me away from a communist dictatorship and give me the opportunity to grow up in the United States, but you know, we were not war refugees. I did, however, grow up with um, extraordinary stories um, that my family told me about their uh, experiences during the Second World War in, in Poland, what it was like to have to hide, to have to run, to um, be in an occupied country where life was very, very cheap and um, seeing friends of theirs taken away and disappeared, seeing people gunned down on the street. My mother had stories like that from her childhood, uh, having their our house searched by uh, Nazi soldiers with German shepherds looking for um, the people that my family was courageously hiding from, from them at the time. And those are the stories that, that for me relate to what's, what's happening right now. Um, we, we have a fight in Ukraine over some of the same questions that we thought were settled by the end of the Second World War. Um, it's being fought on some of the same geography. Um, the victims are people who are very much like the people I knew as a child uh, in, in Poland, people very much like my family. And so I, I do feel a, a sense of kinship and solidarity that comes from not so much my personal experience leaving Poland, but my family's experiences as relate to me uh, of enduring that horrific um, historical tragedy. Council General, I'd like to ask you a question about your strategic and security posture. Um, Poland is in a very difficult position. Uh, it, it has accepted the role of becoming a strategic hub uh, of Western aid to Ukraine, despite a vulnerable position bordering uh, a Russian missile base in uh, Kaliningrad to the north, uh, and then, of course, uh, Russian ally Belarus to the east. Uh, what security concerns do you have? And is there domestic political pressure to reduce Poland's role as this the kind of logistics hub in view of potential uh, threats from the Russians or, or uh, uh, from Belarus? I think that the pressure is actually quite the opposite because it all comes from the understanding that um, Russia in, in many historical forms uh, has been the state of the ambitious um, to absorb, uh, incorporate other independent states for years. Poland um, in the recent history was not the, the, the formal part of the Soviet bloc, but it was associated with the, was on, on the eastern side of the Iron Curtain 
for for many years. Uh, remember also the partition of Poland uh, in the 19th century. So uh, that gives us the, the perspective of the threat uh, that is coming back in many moments of the history. Um, and with this understanding, we know that we have to stand against it and being allied uh, within NATO structures, being a part of the European Union. We try to, um, we actually have been vocal for years um, to implement the policy uh, that actually once and for good um, limits or stop the, the, these uh, ambitions of, of Russia and uh, Mr. Putin. Um, right now, the concern is obviously the same, that the ambitions of Russia are going beyond Ukraine and eventually, um, uh, well, the, the operation has not been successful in, in Ukraine to the extent that, that Putin would wish. Uh, so at least we know that uh, this threat to other countries is, is at least postponed. Uh, but if you remember Polish President Lech Kaczynski, um, in Georgia, in Tbilisi, when the uh, Russian invasion in Georgia started, was actually um, uh, warning the West that um, after Georgia, there is Ukraine and there are perhaps Baltic countries and also eventually Poland. Um, and, and with that in mind, we know that the only response is to, 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 to be strongly allied against the, uh, the, the Russian uh, attempts to recreate the greater Russia, um, uh, maybe Soviet Union, maybe even beyond. Um, uh, we advocate for supporting Ukraine militarily. Uh, we support Ukrainian refugees in Poland. Um, and we try to concentrate all the powers to actually uh, stand up against it. Uh, there is no uh, solution in weakening the position of Poland uh, in terms of how much we are engaged in supporting Ukraine, because uh, we know that eventually it will lead us to something that is quite uh, the opposite. Uh, that that hunger for Russia to, to eventually maybe even invade Poland and other countries might be stronger uh, if we are not responding uh, with, with the power. And as you can see from the experience, 2014 and annexation of Crimea is actually uh, the, the greatest proof of that. So now we have the ultimate chance uh, to, to not only make this aggression in Ukraine stop, uh, but uh, put the final stop on, these, on this ambition uh, of Russia uh, to, to um, attack and maybe even invade the, the Western world. Um, and understanding within Polish society of that is, is very strong. Uh, there is every support uh, that is needed to, 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 to offer our assistance to Ukrainians in all possible fields. Sure. Um, Congressman, there has been a lot of talk that Putin is intentionally forcing a refugee crisis in the countries surrounding Ukraine as a means to destabilize these countries. Do you agree with this analysis? I don't know. I think um, certainly what he did in Syria, mm -hmm. no question in my mind that that was part of the Russian strategy to drive more Syrians um, to flee the country, uh, push them into Western Europe where they would uh, pose a political challenge to um, democratic EU NATO member states. Um, so maybe he felt that he could achieve the same thing. Uh, that would be a collateral benefit of his attack on Ukraine. But the important thing is that it's failed um, because there has been an outpouring of generous support for these temporarily displaced uh, Ukrainians in, in um, the European Union. And I don't see any evidence that it has destabilized any, uh, any government people want to support Ukraine. And uh, I think if, if, if that was his intention, it would just be one of, uh, another one of his miscalculations. Uh, Emily, would you please give people instructions on how they can pose a question either live or in the chat room? Uh, and then I have a final question and uh, Aaron will do a final question, then we'll turn it over to some uh, audience questions, please.
Sure, if you would like to ask our speakers a question, you can do so at the bottom of your screen in the Q&A function, or if you would like to ask a question live, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you. Uh, one question, not, a, not, a, not one statement, not a question from Felix Litvinsky. As a person from Ukraine and a proud American, thank you to the Polish people and Consul General Kubitsky. Well, thank you uh, from our audience. Uh, Consul General, um, there was a story, I believe, on NBC uh, or MSNBC just uh, in the past uh, day uh, that the number of volunteers uh, in Poland uh, has, has sh have been sharply reduced. Uh, I guess my question is what, uh, for, for private American citizens who want to volunteer, want to do something to assist Ukrainians now in Poland, what can we do? What options do we have? What would you recommend? And what do you think that the American government should be doing moving forward to assist Poland through this period? First of all, uh, there are plenty of organizations, both international and, and strictly Polish, working in the field, and they are seeking for, for any form of food volunteer assistance uh, and we can help out you can find that on many websites but also you can reach out to our consular to any of our posts here in the US uh, to find out what organizations are seeking for for what particular uh, kind of help um, there are actually quite a significant I'd say it's a significant number of people here from United States of America uh, doesn't have anything to do with Poland on Ukraine, and they, they are willing to go to Poland to, to assist with the refugees. So that's on the plus side. Obviously, uh, once the Ukraine subject gets a little bit off the front pages of the newspapers, it, it becomes a problem for us and the challenge for us how to keep up this engagement on the level from the first days of uh, wars. Um, and I, be, I believe that this is a strong part of, of our jobs to, to, to keep this interest up because the war is not over. It might even convert into something that is more similar to a form of civic war rather than the regular invasion. We, we know that the Russians are not as successful as they were hoping to be in the initial stage of, of, of the war, but it doesn't mean that they disappear. They're, they're still there. They are committing atrocities on Ukrainian people. Uh, Ukrainian people are in need uh, everywhere, both in Ukraine and in other countries, including Poland. Poland as a state is, is doing a lot of efforts um, to meet with different counterparts, uh, discussing their engagement in terms of financing the, the help of, for Ukrainian people, for, for Ukrainian, uh, for, for displaced Ukrainian people. Um, I know that many organizations are doing the same thing. Um, uh, I think this is another form of the help that, that would be very much appreciated from, from the U.S. private citizens if they were to help. There is many way to, to help financially if, if someone cannot come and help uh, on the spot. Um, so so there, there are a lot of ways to, to, to remain engaged. We, we, we try to keep up this engagement as much as possible. Another way to do it is to um, uh, any form of uh, showing that support to the Ukraine. I have to say that this is my private observation, but uh, also not only a number of, uh, of uh, volunteers is slightly declining, but also a number of Ukrainian flags that are displayed in many places. And this is very unfortunate. I think this, it doesn't cost us anything, but we should uh, show off this sympathy and support for, for Ukraine that helps other people also to understand that this subject is still very valid and, and this, this help is really required. We, we are also, uh, from the Polish perspective in Poland, uh, we're sort of moving from this first initial stage where many private people were engaged into helping Ukrainians into something which is more structurized, more organized manner, because we know that as much as you write, and some people are already going back to Ukraine to their families, some will stay around for a longer period of time. And we need a system and we need a structure uh, provided by the state of Poland, but also in a collaboration with our allies to provide uh, sustainable help for, for, for these displaced people for a longer period of time. And here we really strongly count on a collaboration 
uh, with U.S. administration. We appreciate the decision of accepting 100,000 um, uh, Ukrainians into United States uh, um, in any time soon. We're working in, by the way, with New York City very closely uh, on organizing that for probably majority of these people. You know, most of them will come at least initially to New York City. So, uh, so there is a lot of work uh, going on, uh, but we hope this number can be increased, by the way. 100,000 uh, uh, people is a good start, but as you mentioned in the beginning, we are now at the level of 3.2 million people only in Poland, not mentioning other hundreds of thousands in, in, in other places. Uh, so, so bottom line, a lot of work ahead of us and the challenges will increase, uh, as I said, with uh, us adjusting to the situation um, and, and so, so we never become indifferent to, to, to this problem. We have quite a number of questions and only about 20 minutes left uh, in this conversation. Aaron, why don't you uh, pose the final question to the Congressman and then we'll open it up. Sure. Um, Congress seems mostly unified in its support for humanitarian and military assistance for Ukraine. Congressman, how long do you expect this to last? Well, uh, I hope it lasts. Um, you know, we are, we're living in very polarized partisan times. And, um, you know, there is there is a traditional view in the Republican Party, which uh, remains the view of the overwhelming majority of Democrats as well, that uh, we should be standing up for freedom and democracy around the world, that Putin is uh, our adversary, not our friend, uh, that NATO is bedrock of, uh, of American security and an organization that we should remain committed to. Um, but uh, the reality is that there is also now a strain uh, within the Republican Party represented by the former president and uh, powerful media personalities like Tucker Carlson, who believe the opposite of all of those uh, assertions, who, um, who think that, uh, you know, kind of share Putin's worldview, frankly, uh, and, and, and wonder why uh, we're spending all this money and effort uh, defending little countries uh, in, in Europe, like Ukraine, like the Baltic states. Um, I'll, I'll be very blunt. I think if President Trump had gotten a second term, our troops would have been pulled out of Europe. We would have started a process of pulling out of NATO. That was clearly what he wanted to do. Uh, and, um, and, and, and so there are tensions right now uh, in uh, the Republican Party that are, are not fully resolved yet with respect to uh, to Ukraine. Um, fortunately, again, knock on wood, most members of the House and Senate, um, including most Republicans, have been voting to support Ukraine. But there were, you know, I didn't I remember the final vote last night, but there were certainly, a, I saw a couple of dozen uh, no votes up on the board. Um, there's sort of a minimum of five or six Republicans in the House who vote against any uh, help and support for, for Ukraine. And among their base, there, there is a, a much louder, more active faction that um, believes we shouldn't be doing this. So um, good so far, but there's a risk down the road. Uh, I, I noted uh, that uh, the good news is that only 37 members voted against the $39 billion supplemental appropriation bill last night. The bad news was 39 members of Congress voted against the 39, the 37 members of Congress voted against the bill. It, uh, it, it, I, I agree with the Congressman that there does seem to be these uh, internal tensions that are creating a bit of a drift. Well, why don't we uh, go to uh, some questions and answers? Uh, Emily, do you want to uh, please share one more time uh, instructions on how to ask a question and then I'll start reading some off? Sure, you can do so by typing in at the bottom of your screen using the Q&A function, or if you would like to ask a question live, you can raise your hand and we will unmute you. Okay, Emily, I'm going to allow you to control the live unmuting. Let me just uh, read from the chat room. Uh, Joanna Sauruk, uh, there is an article in the Wall Street Journal today about the revival of bomb shelters in Poland. 
Is Poland preparing for a potential conflict reaching their borders? Council General? I'd say that uh, it's hard for me to say, but as much as we must be prepared for the war and for the further escalation, uh, building this pressure and and kind of keeping this this threat alive that it might be a traditional invasion of Poland is unfortunately part of something that is maybe extended part of, of uh, Russian propaganda. Um, the reason why I mentioned that is uh, any form of threat and, and feeling of being insecure uh, is something that might cause the decisions that will not be in line with the principle that we have from the very beginning of, of, of this war, that Poland and other countries, other Western countries, needs to keep up the, the help, the, the, the very uh, wide uh, help in any, any possible field uh, towards Ukraine and Ukrainian people. I don't see that there is any vital uh, risk um, uh, for the time being of the uh, further expansion, advancing of, of uh, the, the, the military operation uh, by Russia, uh, not even in Ukraine. Uh, so so uh, I don't see that very feasible for, for uh, Russia invading any of the NATO countries. But with that in mind, we need to remember, as Congressman Malinowski said at the beginning, Ukraine is not only fighting for themselves. They are the battlefield of something that if, not, if, if it's not successfully defended, might be um, just the start of something that is uh, much wider uh, and might even go um, uh, abroad from, from, from Ukraine. So I guess any forms of preparations for the wars um, is a smart thing to do. Also the assessment uh, of the assets that, that we have um, uh, for potential use but with that in mind, uh, and with further ongoing supporting of Ukraine, I think that we, we, it's safe to say right now that there is no, no direct threat to Poland uh, at this present moment. All right, uh, Emily, is there a live question? Or shall yeah. I continue to read from the chat room? Go ahead. Yeah, Joseph, you can talk. Good afternoon, and thank you so much for taking my question. Um, a really just interest in your perspective on kind of what Russia's end game might be in all of this. And is this somehow connected to kind of maybe the reestablishment of kind of a new um, kind of Soviet Republic kind of uh, along the East? Thank you. Jonathan, where are you from? Uh, Joseph, where are you from, if I may ask? Uh, California. I've spent some time in Ukraine. I lived there for about a month, um, mostly in the East. And um, it's a beautiful, lovely country. Yeah. Great. Thank you for joining us. Congressman uh, or Consul General, perspective on that? Uh, let's remember Russia's initial goal was to end Ukraine. It was to uh, capture the capital of Kyiv and other major cities, um, to overthrow the Ukrainian government, replace it with uh, puppet loyalists of, uh, of Putin. And Russia failed in that uh, achieving that initial goal. They were defeated uh, in the Battle of Kiev. Uh, they were pushed back from most of the cities that they were uh, besieging, with the exception of uh, the, the, the most dramatic exception of Mariupol. Um, and so now they, yes, have these revised uh, um, ambitions, which appear to be uh, involve um, uh, conquering and defending an expanded version of the enclave that they already controlled in eastern Ukraine from the beginning of the war in, in 2014, um, including a land bridge connecting Russia uh, with, uh, with Crimea. Um, I guess it remains to be seen whether Putin will try to formally annex these territories in, into Russia, uh, that he hasn't actually secured them yet. Um, the Ukrainians have made a lot of gains in just the last few days in taking back territory in the east that, uh, that the Russians had taken early on uh, in the war. Uh, and um, the military balance, I think, is shifting gradually in, in Ukraine's favor. Um, you know, it, uh, you, we, we went into this war thinking that Russia had the second best army in the 
the world. And now it's pretty clear that they have the second best army in Ukraine. And the Ukrainian military is getting stronger by the day because of the, uh, the weapons and training it's receiving from NATO countries. And the Russian military is getting weaker because they're losing um, men and material and nobody is resupplying them. Um, so uh, yes, I think that is their goal, but, uh, and, and that could lead to a, a, a rather ugly and protracted conflict in the East, but I'm, I'm, I don't believe they have the capability of achieving uh, a, a, a version of that goal that will be satisfactory to Putin. Emily? Okay, Gabrielle, you have permission to speak. Gabrielle, are you with us? Okay, it sounds like maybe you can't unmute, but let me just, before we go to the next question, or maybe uh, Emily can assist Gabrielle. Congressman, I just want to ask you a question. You know, all politics is local, uh, and we talked about what happens, what's happening on the floor of the House. But I'm curious, uh, we are nonpartisan, uh, but as a, as a matter of fact, it is fair to say that you have, you are a Democrat in one of the most Republican districts in the United States of America. Uh, and so I'm curious as to what you hear at home. What are your constituents telling you about a $39 billion supplemental appropriations bill and supporting Ukraine? Uh, I do represent a Republican district. I wouldn't say it's one of the most in the country, or I don't think okay. I, I could be here. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it does lean slightly Republican. But you know what? I'm, I'm really thrilled that when I'm driving around the rural and suburban towns in New Jersey that I represent, I see more Ukraine flags than Trump flags flying these days. It, this is an issue that has captured the imagination of a lot of Americans, and not just those who follow or policy. Um, and I think it's because they, they're inspired by the bravery, fighting spirit of the Ukrainian people. And they see that this is really about good versus evil. And, and Americans, um, they like a good, good fight between good versus evil. We like to be on the right side of, of, of those, those fights. So um, I get a lot of uh, uh, very legitimate concerns about the, what's happening in the economy right now. I think a lot of people understand that the gas prices that we are paying are at least in part the result of this war. Um, um, and I hope, I hope folks understand that when we decided uh, rightly and righteously to stop the importation of Russian oil and to persuade other countries to do the same thing, it would inevitably have this result. Um, but it's still a significant burden and so I feel like you know, my main, my number one responsibility right now, we're helping Ukraine. We're gonna do more to help Ukraine. My number one responsibility is to try to reduce some of the burden that my constituents are feeling, are facing, carrying because of, um, uh, because of the loss of Russian energy. Emily, do we have a live question? Okay. Um... Gabrielle still has permission, um, but I don't think it's working on her end. Okay. How about Abby Scher or Joanna Sorok? Can you open up for Joanna? Uh, I can ask if they would like to, sure. Okay, well, why don't I read Joanna's uh, sure. question uh, from the chat room then. Uh, what is the long-term strategy to support the refugees in Poland and is the EU providing financial support? Council General? Uh, EU has agreed, obviously, to, to provide the financial assistance. We are working on the uh, kind of logistics of that. Uh, we encourage to, to provide, obviously, uh, more of that assistance as we see that this uh, situation will not uh, end within the next weeks. We would rather be something that we have to be concerned of uh, for, for another month. Uh, again, we try to exercise the approach that has never been exercised before to the scale um, uh, we, we speak of. Um, we offered and widely promoted applying for a Polish social security number, PESEL. This is the, the number that allows uh, people to 
I take advantage of different uh, social programs in Poland, including education for children, um, uh, helping them with, with their language, which might be some, sometimes a barrier, and also applying for jobs for many different uh, forms of support in Poland. So they can live their lives um, as normal as, as possible. We know that we need to provide the relief also to Polish families and many institutions that offer that help for Ukrainian people. Some of Polish families are still hosting Ukrainian families in their living rooms as we speak. So we need to have the system. So the 3 million people, which is, by the way, almost it's, it will be over 8 percent of Polish population. It's a, it's a huge number. Um, uh, so, so uh, these people can can actually um, uh, leave the form of, of living that is not like the refugees, as we know from from the past events in the history, but rather uh, people who can become a part of the the, the Polish society uh, for the time they need it, and it will bo work both ways eventually. Um, and this will, first of all, even from, from their perspective, this is something that um, uh, gives them the dignity of, of having their own lives, even though they are uh, abroad. But uh, for Poland, this is also reversed contribution, so to speak. It helps to, to provide this help for, for extended uh, amount of time. If we are offering those people with jobs, they can start working. They can start also to contribute to to, to uh, contribute back to Poland uh, for for how long they need. Um, as I said, this is uh, a bit of an unusual uh, approach. It is working so far. We do working with our allies and with our partners in European Union in the United States of America uh, on providing the assistance. By the way, if I may. Uh, I just wanted to say to, to Congressman Malinowski that we very appreciate all the efforts, efforts that the Congress is taking uh, into promoting the needs that Ukrainians and Ukraine has, both for Ukrainians in Ukraine, but also for those who are in Poland and other countries. We know that this is not easy, it's unprecedented for all of us, but, but we, we do see that these efforts, and I know that many of the congressmen has already been to Poland, they saw how it works in Poland, uh, right now, and, and it obviously helps. So, as 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 much as as we can work together, I think we, we might be successful with that operation. But again, it's unprecedented and uh, unprecedented, and and many challenges are still ahead of us. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one final question. We're going to wrap up in just about four minutes or so. Uh, and so I'm going to pose a question by Felix Lefinski. What, addi what additional steps are taken by the U.S. government to improve a process to bring more Ukrainians to the U.S.? Congressman, do you have perspective on that? Is there any talk in Congress about um, increasing the flow of Ukrainians to the U.S.? Um, I think we want to see how, how things go with the, the commitment that President Biden made. Uh, again, I would go back to the point that um, this is not a traditional refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. We always assume people leave their country. They all want to come to America. They want to come to Western Europe. That's not true for the vast majority of the Ukrainians who have come to Poland and other uh, countries of, of, uh, of refuge. They, they want to be safe um, uh, while the fighting is still devastating their country, then they want to go back as quickly as possible. And so the thrust of our policy should be enabled to, be, to enable that to happen. I'm not even sure if we'll fill the 100,000 um, commitment. If, if it looks like the demand is that high or greater and I'm wrong, then, then we should look into revising it. Um, there is discussion in Congress about something that doesn't get as much attention. Uh, and that is uh, the other group of refugees from this conflict who are seeking permanent resettlement. These are not Ukrainians, these are Russians. Tens of thousands of Russians have, uh, have been leaving their country because they cannot tolerate life under the increasingly totalitarian war regime that Putin is imposing on that country. They happen to be in many cases, the best and brightest people in Russia. They're scientists and engineers. They're, they're 
uh, artists. They, they, they are uh, people with enormous talent, uh, entrepreneurs, um, not oligarchs, <laughs> but, but people who could actually contribute a great deal uh, to us if we were willing to make Putin's loss our game. And so the administration has proposed um, uh, creating an easier pathway for some of these Russians with significant skills to come to the United States. And again, that is a much more permanent resettlement because I don't think any of them have uh, optimistic hopes of um, Russia changing in the coming months. Before I properly thank uh, our speakers, let me remind you, Tuesday, May 17th, Congressman Ami Vera uh, will be talking about developments in the U.S.-China bilateral relationship. That will be at 7 p.m. Uh, East Coast time. Tuesday, May 24th, Congressman Adam Schiff, Congressman John Katko, uh, a panel of pollsters uh, and experts on misinformation, disinformation, and media manipulation at the Cornell University Brooks Institute of uh, Politics and Global Affairs first ever uh, Summit on Solutions for Democracy. That will be at the Cornell Club in New York City, but there will be a virtual option. We will be sharing the results of a fascinating uh, and, and unpredictable poll that we just commissioned on electoral attitudes towards democracy, particularly in battleground congressional districts. Again, that is Tuesday, May 24th. You can register on our website, just Google or being Cornell Institute of Politics. Congressman Malinowski and Consul General Kubitsky, thank you for your leadership. Uh, you, this arguably a very busy time for both of you, uh, but you chose to share close to an hour with uh, Cornell University. And for that, we're deeply grateful. And we hope that we will see you soon. Thank you to both gentlemen. Thank uh, you. And with that, we wish everybody good health. So long, everybody. Thank you.